Masturbation. Everyone does it. Monkeys do it, dolphins do it, elephants, walruses, bats, turtles, and of course humans do it. But as normal as it is, it still carries a great deal of stigma and is surrounded by harmful myths that create shame and confusion around the subject. There are claims that it can cause blindness, mental illness, hairy palms, and a whole host of other problems. But where did those myths come from? The answer might just surprise you. One of the most bizarre myths surrounding masturbation is that it can cause a person to grow hair on their palms if they indulge in the practice too often. The origins of this particular myth are difficult to trace, and there's some debate regarding where it initially started. After all, hairy palms aren't as common as blindness, insanity, or any of the other supposed adverse effects associated with masturbation. So where did this notion come from that touching yourself would lead to something out of a deleted scene from Teen Wolf? According to one theory, it might have actually been a simple mistranslation. At the beginning of the 19th century, a popular French idiom emerged that translated to having hair on one's palms. It was intended to refer to someone behaving in a lazy, self-indulgent way. It just so happened that one of the behaviors most associated with masturbation was laziness and a poor work ethic. It stands to reason then that this phrase would be used to describe frequent masturbators. Given that the English nobility at the time enjoyed throwing around French words and phrases to make themselves sound more cultured and refined, it is entirely possible that they use this particular idiom as well. All it would take was one especially literal person hearing it, then repeating it to others who then repeated it again and after a nationwide game of telephone, the notion of masturbation giving someone actual hair on their palms would become a common belief. Possibly the most commonly repeated masturbation myth is that overindulging in the behavior can cause you to go blind. Suffice it to say that that's absolutely not true. The only way for masturbation to affect someone's vision is if they do it so vigorously they burst a blood vessel in their eye. However, that is extremely unlikely. So where did the idea of a connection between self-pleasure and eyesight come from? As is often the case with misinformation, it's difficult to pinpoint the exact origins of the myth, but one of its sources is actually a group generally associated with wisdom ancient Greek philosophers. Aristotle believed that the area around the eyes was the part of the head most fruitful of semen, and that this could be depleted by excessive masturbation. Pythagoras and his followers believed that the semen was comprised of brain matter, describing it as a drop of the brain. That's one Pythagorean theorem you won't hear about in math class. If semen was assumed to come from the brain, and the stores of the liquid around the eyes, believing that expelling a great deal of semen would negatively impact eyesight or worse, made sense. Of course, the problem with this theory was that it was based on incorrect assumptions about the human body. Unfortunately, the myth persisted beyond ancient Greece. In 1712, an anonymously published monograph was released claiming to have been penned by a doctor. Its title was Onania, or the heinous sin of self-pollution and all its frightful consequences in both sexes considered with spiritual and physical advice to those who have already injured themselves by this abominable practice. How's that for a mouthful? Onania warned that masturbation would lead to disturbances of the stomach and digestion, loss of appetite or ravenous hunger, vomiting, nausea, weakening of the organs of breathing, coughing, hoarseness, paralysis, blindness, weakening of the organ of generation to the point of impotence, and suicide. Even as the list of symptoms supposedly associated with masturbation grew, blindness was always included. It seems that physicians just couldn't shake the association between masturbation and the loss of vision, in spite of the lack of practical evidence to support it. In the 18th century, a Swiss physician by the name of Samuel Auguste Tissot decided to weigh in on the subject. He published Onanism, a treatise on the maladies produced by masturbation, in 1758. In it, he claimed that one ounce of semen was equal to 40 ounces of blood and therefore, masturbation caused dramatic amounts of energy and blood loss. He claimed that emissions of semen outside of procreative sex would lead to fever, delirium, and within four hours, death. He further elaborated that excessive masturbation and even loss of semen through nocturnal emissions or wet dreams could cause, quote, a general wasting of the animal machine a debility of all bodily senses and of all the faculties of the mind, the loss of imagination and of the memory, imbecility, the shame and the disgrace attendant upon it, all the functions disturbed, suspended, or painful, long, severe, and disgusting diseases. So his general attitude towards masturbation was, in a word, harsh. As the misinformation continued to spread, more anti-masturbation crusaders came up with new theories about managing what they saw as a public health crisis. One of the most staunch believers in the negative health impacts of masturbation was a Battle Creek, Michigan physician 
and Seventh-day Adventist named John Harvey Kellogg. As a physician, his health advice ranged from reasonable to, let's just say, eccentric. He advocated for fresh air and exercise, avoiding alcohol and tobacco, and maintaining a vegetarian diet. However, he also believed that one of the worst things that anyone could do for their health was masturbate. He considered it to be harmful to a person's spiritual, physical, and emotional well-being. In fact, he was so anti-ejaculation in any form that he famously avoided sex altogether. He and his wife never consummated their marriage, they slept in separate beds, and adopted all their children. Many myths about the adverse effects of masturbation can be traced back to Kellogg's writing, specifically in his 1877 book, Plain Facts for Old and Young, Embracing the Natural History and Hygiene of Organic Life. In his book, he provided a laundry list of symptoms that supposedly afflicted the chronic masturbator. These included mood swings, fickleness, bashfulness, boldness, bad posture, stiff joints, fondness for spicy foods, acne, palpitations, and epilepsy. Wait. What was that one in the middle? The spicy foods thing? It kind of seems like it came out of nowhere. Well, from Kellogg's perspective, diet and behavior were directly linked. If a person's diet consisted of heavily spiced foods, of meat, sugar, and really anything flavorful or exciting, it would inflame their sexual desires and cause them to act out via masturbation. But if one stuck to a plain, bland diet of primarily grains and nuts, they would be able to suppress those urges and keep their hands above their waist. Kellogg was not the only proponent of this idea, by the way. The notion of using a bland diet to curb masturbatory urges was also popularized by a minister named Sylvester Graham, who believed masturbation polluted the soul and the body, as well as causing insanity and blindness. Graham primarily ate bread made from coarsely ground wheat or rye flour, which he eventually began to use in his muffins and crackers. That's right, surprise, Sylvester Graham was that Graham responsible for the famous graham cracker. At the time, these crackers were unsweetened, and no one would have dared to sandwich chocolate and marshmallows between them. Kellogg was born a year after Graham died, and influenced by his ideas in adulthood, was poised to carry on his legacy of grain-fueled anti-masturbation crusades. He devoted his time to developing a simple, easy-to-prepare breakfast food that could replace the decadent and sinful meat-based breakfast popular at the time. He began with graham crackers, which he baked and crumbled into smaller pieces to be eaten with a spoon. He christened it granola, but was unsatisfied with the product and continued experimenting. Along with his brother William, he developed a few additional cereals, one made from flaked wheat and another made from corn, which the two named Corn Flakes. William suggested they add sugar to the recipe in order to improve the taste, but John refused to compromise on his vision. This resulted in a split between the brothers and a subsequent lawsuit that won Will the right to sell the cereals with his new recipe under his name, Kellogg. A double food surprise for the price of one. Two of the most famous snacks in American history, graham crackers and Kellogg's cornflakes, were forged in the fires of fanatical anti-masturbation activism. In addition to his recommended bland diet, Kellogg also suggested more extreme measures to curtail masturbation. He would recommend that parents tie their children's hands to their bedposts, and would even suggest mutilation or pouring acid on the genitals to prevent masturbation. But don't worry, that was only if the cornflakes didn't work. The deeper you dig into the various myths around masturbation, the more apparent it becomes that many of them are related. Another misconception about masturbation is that it lowers energy, vitality, and focus. The link between orgasms and a loss of energy can be traced all the way back to Taoism. In Taoism, semen is vital for the nourishment of both the brain and the body and must be retained rather than expelled in order to preserve a man's life force. According to Su Nu Jung, a treatise on sex written in the 3rd century CE, intercourse without ejaculation strengthens the energies, and after intercourse twice without ejaculation, one's hearing and sight improve. The ancient Greeks shared a similar belief. That's right, the ancient Greeks contributed to this view of ejaculation as well. Hippocrates frequently discussed the importance of keeping the body in balance and maintaining correct levels of the four humors thought to be found in the body, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. In his view, too much ejaculation could throw off the balance. Plato advised men to retain their semen to remain strong, citing abstinent athletes as proof. By the way, many athletes follow this advice to this day, avoiding sex and masturbation before a big game. It should be noted that there is no scientific evidence to back up that theory. A systematic review of scientific evidence on the effects of sexual activity on performance in sports found that there is no correlation between this activity and poor athletic performance. 
New York Yankees manager Casey Stengel once said on the subject, it's not the sex that wrecks these guys, it's the staying up all night looking for it. Essentially, it isn't the activity or the ejaculation that results in a loss of energy and athletic prowess. It's the late nights, vigorous physical activity, and other adjacent behaviors such as the consumption of alcohol while at bars and clubs that might lead athletes to do poorly the day after a wild night with a sexual partner. You might have noticed that these early beliefs do not draw a distinction between ejaculation during sex and ejaculation from masturbation, believing it to be detrimental no matter what. Masturbation became the obvious target over time since sex is necessary for the continuation of the species and cannot be cut out of all people's lives indefinitely. Some of this shift can be attributed to the church in medieval Europe. According to the church, God commanded his people to go forth and multiply, so procreation was the name of the game. Therefore, procreative sex within the bounds of marriage was highly encouraged. However, any semen that was spilled without this intent was sinful and, in fact, dangerous. If someone masturbated, theologians believed that demons stole the semen and used it to impregnate women out of wedlock. These were succubi, female demons who seduced and stole the semen of men, and incubi, the same demon in the form of a man who would then impregnate a woman. Most people don't believe in semen demons anymore, but echoes of these historical beliefs about semen and vitality and the evils of masturbation have persisted to the modern day. There are online communities dedicated to semen retention where users claim they've experienced improved concentration and focus after giving up masturbation. However, there is no research to back it up. In fact, there is research that suggests masturbation can improve focus due to the chemicals released in the brain during orgasm. Other users in these communities repeat pseudoscientific claims that feel like something out of Pythagoras or Aristotle's writings. And for once, that is not a compliment. They claim that because all parts of the body are connected, semen must come from other parts of the body when the testicles have emptied. One popular claim is that it takes 30 days for the body to turn digested food into 10 grams of semen. This is patently false, as the testicles produce approximately 1,500 sperm per second. And also, this might be obvious, but apparently it bears repeating that no part of the body other than the testicles and the prostate are capable of producing semen and sperm. That simply is not how the human body works. The NoFap movement from a Reddit thread and subsequent subreddit is a community based around the supposed harms of masturbation and the supposed benefits of cutting it out completely. NoFap claims that it can cure erectile dysfunction, increase testosterone, and improve confidence and sexual performance. But does abstinence increase testosterone? According to several studies, the answer is no. Some research has shown that there is no change in testosterone levels at all after masturbation while one study actually indicated an increase in testosterone levels after orgasm. There doesn't appear to be any measurable links between masturbation and negative health outcomes in men, contrary to what NoFap suggests. So what, then, is causing the problems that many attribute to masturbation? As it turns out, these effects might be related to personal perceptions of and attitudes about masturbation and sex. If someone views masturbation as an activity to feel guilty about, then the stress that this guilt places on your body can cause negative health impacts that they fear. A study investigating the motivations behind abstinence found that most people who choose to abstain from masturbation do so because they view it as unhealthy or wrong. This leads to guilt, anxiety, and depression following a perceived relapse. These feelings can decrease testosterone levels and lead to other issues such as erectile dysfunction and difficulty with sexual performance and blindness. Just kidding. You might have noticed that this discussion of masturbation and myths surrounding it have skewed toward guys so far. While some anti-masturbation advocates did reference women, Kellogg for example, most of them don't even bother. The fact of the matter is, there are far fewer myths about female masturbation. Why? Well, that would be due to one of the most widespread masturbation myths of all. Women don't do it. However, a survey of British women found that 91% of women masturbate, and 36% of women polled admitted to doing it several times a week. There are other myths that go along with this one, including the myth that women don't watch porn. They do. One in three porn users are women. Why do people believe that women don't masturbate even though it isn't true? A great deal of this is due to the stigma surrounding the act, which is often considered to be more masculine in nature. Though the relationship between society and female sexuality has always been fraught, some of the stigma around female masturbation can be traced to the work of Dr. Sigmund Freud. Freud, as it turns out, had some major issues with the clitoris. He believed that the elimination of clitoral sexuality was necessary for femininity because it was immature and masculine in nature. 
In the Victorian era, it was a common assumption that women did not experience sexual pleasure or desire. Therefore, excessive masturbation in young women was thought to be a cause of hysteria, a now debunked condition believed to be characterized by a woman's uterus detaching and wandering throughout the body, causing erratic behavior and physical ailments. Ironically enough, one of the treatments for this supposed disease was pelvic massage involving vaginal and clitoral stimulation administered by a physician. This would include paroxysm or orgasm and was thought to keep the symptoms of hysteria at bay. So, essentially, women weren't allowed to masturbate themselves, but if a doctor did it, that was perfectly fine. Women who were not given this treatment could find themselves prescribed clitoridectomies, the surgical removal of the clitoris. They were also prescribed exercise, rest, and fresh air to cure them of these urges. So, if female masturbation was acknowledged to exist at all, it was regarded as deviant or even dangerous behavior. Though it didn't share the myths associated with ejaculation and loss of semen, hysteria caused by masturbation was thought, if left untreated, to lead to digestive issues, epilepsy, and even death. Not only are a lot of the claims about masturbation's supposed harms untrue, but there's evidence to suggest it can actually be helpful. A study by the Cancer Council Victoria in Melbourne, Australia found that frequent masturbation correlates to a lower chance of developing prostate cancer. Contrary to claims that masturbation can cause erectile dysfunction, it can actually help prevent it. Regular masturbation exercises the pelvic floor, helping to prevent incontinence and erectile dysfunction later in life. According to hormone therapy specialist Dr. Jennifer Landa, masturbation can boost the immune system by triggering the release of cortisol, a stress hormone that can aid with immune system function in small doses. Additionally, a 2004 research study found that people with penises had a higher white blood cell count 45 minutes following a self-administered orgasm. It might prevent heart disease, too. A report from the Massachusetts Aging Study determined that men who had two or more orgasms per week were 45% less likely to die of cardiovascular disease than those who had one or less per month. And of course, it makes you feel good, too, not just physically but mentally. Masturbation releases dopamine and oxytocin, brain chemicals that activate the reward centers of the brain and provide a mood boost. These happy brain chemicals can also help with sleep, providing some much-needed relief from a bout of insomnia. It's only fair after discussing the benefits of masturbation to discuss some of the potential negative impacts. If someone ignores their body signals while masturbating, pushing past feelings of discomfort, numbness, itchiness, or soreness, they risk irritating their genitals and potentially causing micro-tears in the delicate skin. Using too much pressure during masturbation can decrease sensitivity, leading to less satisfying sexual experiences. However, both these possible problems can be avoided by listening to your body and taking necessary breaks. Notice that blindness, insanity, or any of the other wild symptoms that quack doctors from the 17 and 1800s came up with did not make this list. Of course, any behavior can become harmful if it causes you to neglect the important things in your life, ignore the people you care about, or hurt yourself physically and mentally. By the way, one way to avoid that harm is to not spread false information or repeat centuries-old myths from cereal manufacturers and ancient philosophers. Now watch weird facts about the male body or watch this video instead.